Hallelujah. Come on, let's give Jesus praise this morning. Give somebody a Bluetooth high five over there. Or you can give a normal high five. We're not afraid of touching people anymore. So this morning, welcome to CRC, the best place to be on behalf of Pastor At and Pastor Nareta. It's an honor and a privilege to have you with us today. Thank you for being here. Then also live, we would like to welcome Facebook Live, YouTube, and then also correctional services, Uppington, Priska, Rietfontein, Kakamas, Achenais, and Springbok. It's great to have you with us this morning. You're welcome to take your seat this morning. We're going to continue in the second part of our series. And as I said, that we are kicking off this year to make sure that we will reach our destination at the end of the year. This is called the year of supernatural acceleration. And I see there's a lot of confusion in the beginning of the year. Come on, January is over now. Most of you have been praying for the month end. Now the month end is there. Okay. I don't know why we have to live our lives like that. But it's not necessary. Because we don't have to live from almost. We don't have to live from just enough or almost enough. You can live in more than enough. But then you have to follow the principles of the word. So this morning we're going to continue with basic Christian foundations. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because it's so fundamental in everything we do. We've had a great harvest event. Many people got saved. Many people are watching us online. There's a lot of big business people that are actually watching us online that sent me messages. And that's why media, we always have to have everything in super excellence. Because people are used to the best when it comes to television. And when we do something, it needs to be the best Otherwise, we lose people because we are not excellent. Okay, nobody likes chaos. Nobody likes to watch something that is not done in excellence. Okay, that's why there needs to be order in everything that we do. And it needs to be the best. Amen? So even if we don't have the best cameras and we don't have the best equipment yet, but you don't have to look like you are cheap. You can have something average and you can still look fantastic, okay? It's like people think that wearing the brand causes you to be better. No, it's you wearing your clothes, not your clothes wearing you, okay? So you can have something less expensive, and it can still look expensive because it's not determined on the outside. It's determined in the value on the inside, okay? So media, let's do that. Every department, amen? serve in excellence we are talking about the capstone the cornerstone and the capstone jesus christ we're talking about serving in excellence we're talking about being built into the house of god so last week we spoke about jesus the cornerstone we spoke about the the the, the jumping blocks where you you start the starting blocks for the athlete how you get into position and then you launch yourself out from that position so we know that the starting blocks is something concrete it's something strong it's something settled it's something that you don't need to improve it because it's already been proven are you with me you need to rely on it with everything and we are going to go into the second part and we're going to look at the different bible doctrines according to the book of hebrews and when we look at these things, it is to, to propel you into your future, to propel you into being strong. So I'm teaching a bit. So you have to put on your thinking caps, bring your pen, bring your paper, write your notebook. Because this is basic Christian foundations that will launch you into the rest of your life. Amen. So looking back at last week, the recap, we discovered that Jesus is our cornerstone. Jesus is the model according to which everything is fashioned. We discovered that Jesus is the rock upon which the church is being built. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. When we discover who Jesus is, we discover our true identity. When we discover who Jesus is, we discover what we should be. And in one moment we are changed to be like Jesus. Now we understand that spiritually you are born again, which means your spirit is brand new, perfect, nothing wrong with it. When you give your life to Jesus, God gives you, takes the heart of flesh or the heart of stone and He gives you a heart of flesh. God comes and He renews your spirit. There's nothing wrong with your spirit. Your spirit lacks nothing. 
when you are born again. You are complete in Christ. Your spirit is strong. Your spirit is everything you need. And then we understand that the second part is your mind, your emotion. You know, Satan is after your mind. And the older you get, the more you will understand it, how many thoughts comes into your mind. Now, you cannot determine the thoughts that come into your mind. Because most thoughts are planted by Satan. Because he's after your mind. He wants to get to your mind. But you can decide what you're going to do with the thoughts. It's like walking outside. You can't stop the birds from flying over your head. But you can stop them from nesting in your hair. So what do you do with the thoughts that come through your head? Are you just letting them fly past? Or are you going to allow them to nest in your head? Because the second part of our humanity, which is our soul, our mind, our emotions, our will, our intellect. That part is the complex part. That is the part that the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have to renew your mind on a daily basis. The battlefield is your mind. Your mind is your enemy, nothing else. It's not always the enemy, but the inner me that you have to fight with. What do you think about yourself? Through this COVID, we have discovered that. How people would go back to the old thoughts, the old ways of life, the old ways of thinking. And now you are still trapped with some of those things that you got yourself into. Now you're still trying to work your way out of it. And there's a greater way to get out of it. There's a better way to get out of it. So spiritually, you are born again. Soulishly, in your mind, you are being born again. It's a process. It's a journey. It starts and you are on your way. Jesus says, the good work that I have started, I will bring to completion. As long as you are growing and not stagnating. Because if you stagnate, it's a problem. Because you're just going to backslide. Solid. Amen. So we discovered that Jesus is the cornerstone. Now we know the flesh, the flesh, the flesh will be born again one day when we go to heaven and we get our other body. When we leave this dirt behind and we move into our glorified body as the Bible tells us. The day that you walk into heaven, that is the day that you dress, you are dressed with light, you are dressed with your glorious body, the glory of God. You are dressed with an apparel that nothing Nothing can be taken away from it because it's God's glory. You will be dressed like that. So our process is in our mind. Our process is in following our spirit and not being led by our flesh. Amen. And we have discovered that the cornerstone of everything that we do is Jesus Christ. To be like Him is what I want. Less of me, more of you. Jesus is our perfect example. If you ever want to study the life of any person, you want to study the life of Jesus. If you ever want to study any book, you want to study the Bible, the four Gospels of the Bible. And you don't want to do it religiously. You want to do it with an open mind. You want to do it with reality in, 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 in mind. Sometimes we make Jesus out to be the superhuman being, the super, and you miss his humanity. And this is exactly what we were talking about last week, is that Jesus came as a man, God in flesh, God the Son, the Son of God. Jesus being the Son of God means that He walked like you, He talked like you, He was tempted like you, He went through everything. And the best thing that you can do is study His model and discover and say, okay, if He did it, I can do it. If He can overcome sin, I can overcome sin. How did He do it? And you watch Him closely by the power of the Holy Spirit, being led by the Spirit and not by the flesh. Amen. And Jesus completed everything for us. We discovered that Jesus is God. We discovered that Jesus is the cornerstone. And we discovered that Jesus is the capstone, which means the beginning and the end. Cornerstone, beginning, end, capstone. So he's complete. And he has done a complete work. When he hung on the cross, he said, it is finished. Not I am finished. He said, it is finished. What? This job that I had to come to do to restore man to God. This thing that I had to do to come and destroy the power of sin. This thing that I had to come to do to show people that they are stronger than they think. If they would just believe in me. Jesus came, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way but by me to come to the Father. There is no other way. There is no other way. There is no other way. The world wants to tell you that God is, is, is like a mountain. You can climb Him from any side as long as you get to the top. It, it doesn't matter. If you're a Muslim, you climb from this side. If you're a Buddhist, you climb from that side. If you are an atheist, you don't climb at all. 
But there are different faiths, different views, and there are different ways to get to God. Now that is hogwash. That is this world's agenda. Jesus said, I am. And no one except me. Muhammad did not die for you. Muhammad cannot save you. Buddha did not die for you. Buddha cannot save you. And I'll be outspoken about this because we get into a place where they don't want us to say these things, especially on social media. There is only one. His name is Jesus. He's the only one. Jesus was the only God that would leave his Godhead and become a human. To show his people that I know what you are going through. That there is nothing you can tell me that I don't know what you are going through. He knows everything. He knows betrayal. He knows all things. That's why Jesus became our role model. That's why Jesus became the model citizen of the kingdom. That's why Jesus became the cornerstone that we can be solid on Him. If you can be like Him, you will be perfect. That's exactly the whole point. Nothing about Jesus made Him out to be perfect. Because He came as a man. And the Bible says he was the rejected cornerstone. What is a rejected cornerstone? It's when you look at the bricks and you see this one was burnt and you throw it out. Religion looked at him and they tested him, they tried him and they found fault with him. The perfect man. They found fault with him. Why do you think people will not find fault with you? If Jesus, who was perfect, walked in perfection, walked without sin, lived without sin, and still they found fault with him to the point where they killed him. You think people won't come after you? Especially if you walk in His footsteps. They will come. They will find fault with everything you do. But that's the thing about a cornerstone. Let the wind come. Let the rain come. Let the water wash. Because strongly I will stand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other is sinking sand. If you are built in Christ, you are strong and His strength is in you. But if you keep on looking at your own strength, you will be destroyed. Our strength is not in us. God is looking. His eyes are going to and through the earth, seeking whom He can find so that He can show Himself strong on their behalf. When I am weak, He is strong. So in my flesh, I cannot boast. But in my spirit, I am solidly born again. Which means I'm a son of God. I'm a cornerstone with Christ. Built upon the cornerstone. Let me rather say it that way. A living stone building in, built into the, uh, the body of Jesus Christ. But that's why I need to be built into the body. Being part of the body. A loose lying brick doesn't attain anything. Jesus is complete. There's nothing lacking in Him. He is complete. He completed everything for us. And... He completed us in Him. When you are walking in Christ, you lack nothing. When you're walking in Christ, there's nothing wrong with you. When you're walking in Christ, you have a full identity. When you are walking in Christ, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. Acts chapter 17 verse 28. For in Him we live, we move, we have our being. As certain also... As the prophet has said, for we are also of his offspring. So when we are in Christ, it means we are like him. We are his offspring, which means he has begotten us. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. Stop looking at what is wrong with you and start to look at what is right with you. It brings us into the next point which is the second building block. I need to explain something. Jesus is our starting block. He is the base from where we work. He is the base, the basis in your life. Everything needs to come back to Christ. That's why we have to live Christ-centered. That's why we have these little wristbands. What would Jesus do? Because every time you're in a situation, you would revert back to, what if this was Jesus? How would he do this? And then you would adjust yourself according to that. What do you do? You renew your mind according to how would Jesus handle this situation? Now, if you don't know much about Jesus, you have a problem because you don't know. Because you think you know. That's why you have to study the life of Jesus. Understand who He is. 
In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. If you don't study the Word, if you don't love the Word, you will never know Jesus in His true aspect. You can get to know Jesus more and more by studying the Word more and more because His Holy Spirit will come and make it alive and make it rhema onto you. Now, every athlete knows that the race consists out of three parts. Any sprint consists out of three parts. And these are the three parts that we are looking at in the next few weeks with the different doctrines, seven basic doctrines. The first part of any race, when you are in the starting block and you get out of the starting block, is called the drive. Three phases called, number one, the drive. Number two, maximum velocity. And number three, maintenance. Three parts of the race. How you get out of the starting block, how you pick up speed to be in front, and how you maintain till you end. Mm -hmm. It says the following, the drive. Which part is the drive? It is to be in the exact shape, position, so that two things can happen. That you can break through the limit and that you can empower yourself to move faster. This is what we need now. Jesus is the starting block. We want to jump into this year. And my question is, how has your January looked like? Because your January needs to take two things. A lot of self-discipline, a lot of power, and a lot of breakthrough attitude. Because if you quit at the beginning of the race, you've quit at everything. Now, praise God, there's still three days left of your January. So rather a late start than no start at all. So it doesn't matter how the previous few weeks of this month was. What matters is what you decide today. How is the next three days going to be like? What am I going to do? How am I going to start this year? Because I've got still three days left of the first month of this year. And this will determine how fast I will end up at the end of this year. So it's going to take a lot of willpower. It's going to take a lot of strong-mindedness. This is why I talk to you about these things. Now, these two legs that has to get out of the starting block. The first leg that we are looking at is the one that is at the back, the one that is kicked onto the rock. Step strong into the rock, okay? Because this is the one that is going to keep you for breakthrough. The other one that needs to propel you forward is the one that drives you. But both these legs is what we call the drive. And we have to start off with a strong start, with a strong position, with a strong mental attitude. You're going to run to win, you're not going to run to lose. You're not going to slip and fall because you're standing upon the rock. The rock won't give. You can put all your power into that. That's why we say the cornerstone is so important. Because you can rely on Jesus no matter what. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never give way. He will always be there. He will always strengthen you. He is dependable for the rest of your life no matter what you do. That is my Jesus. So, Hebrews 6 verse 1. Therefore, Leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. We want to be perfect, right? You don't just want to say, poor me, I'm just a human. Not laying again the foundation. Well, we are laying the foundation again. Because many people don't know the foundation. Which is Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. And then it continues, it says, the foundation of what? Repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. So the drive part, number one, is repentance from dead works and then also faith in God that propels you. Today, we see how far we get because I would love to cover both, but there's a lot of information and I need you to understand this. So if we get out of the starting block, the first thing that we need to do is to make sure that this leg is strong because this leg will give us the breakthrough. 
this leg is going to make sure that this one propels us forward. So the repentance from dead works will help us to live in faith towards God. The repentance of dead works will help us to live in faith towards God. So what is repentance of dead works? Let's first define what is dead works. Dead works, not always, but many times are called good works. My good deed for the day. We think that our good deeds for the day is what makes us good. Jesus said there is nothing good in man. No nothing. There's nothing good in flesh. Now we all know that people are inherently good. Because they want to be good. They want to do good. There's no person that is born that just wants to be pure evil. No person. Maybe something happens to them and then turn them to become evil. But no person is born to be evil. No person is born and has the will to be intentionally wrong. That's why we have to settle some basic doctrines. Okay? Because there are two major doctrines. I'm thinking whether I should bring it in now. Two major doctrines in this world. Two major doctrines in the church. It is the doctrine of free will and the doctrine of predestination. So you have those that believe predestination and you have those that believe free will. And then both of these doctrines can go into the ditch on the left or the right. And then there is the one that God wants us to live. And that is a doctrine of free will and predestination, understanding both. Most people are raised religiously with a doctrine of predestination you are raised that your that god is in control of everything and god has planned your life and if something happens to you it's god's will so from your father that dies at 30 from cancer to the young boy of 7 years old that drowns To the old granny that is 94 years old and die of old age, everything is God's will. Because it's predestined. God knew your days. God counted your days. God knows what's going to happen to you. Now the problem with that is there is some truth in it, but it is not complete truth. Because some of it is God's perfect will, but not all of it is God's perfect will. Some of it is His permitted will. That's all another story. God's perfect will and God's permitted will. When God's got a perfect will for Israel at the moment to say, I can't work with these people, destroy them all, swallow them up and get rid of them. Moses, I will work with you and your family. And then Moses pleads and he says, God, please, God, please, God, please. And then God says, okay, it's all right. Because you have pleaded, Moses, I will leave them with you. And then for 40 years... They had to wait until they could get to the place of God's perfect will because God permitted them to be alive. Shocking. It's like the king. What is his name again? I forgot his name. That prayed and asked God, give me another 10 years. And then he said, God, please, God, please, God, please. He turned his head to, and he prayed and he interceded and he said, God, please give me more time. And then the prophet turned around and the prophet came back. He said, the Lord has heard your prayer and he has given you more time. So what was the perfect will? The perfect will of God was for him to, Chila, come home, go to heaven. That was God's perfect will. But now he persuaded God and God said, okay, my permitted will is for you to stay longer. And then when he stayed longer, what happened? (laughs) In his 10 years, he committed 10 sins that caused his nation to err for decades. That's why, don't just pray God's will, God's will. Find God's will. Now we'll get into that. What is God's will? What is God's perfect will? Now the the reason why I'm saying this is because the, 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 the ideology of predestination says that God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. It doesn't even matter for you to try to figure out what God is thinking and what His will is. All you have to do is be a little worm and be obedient to the will of God because what happens to you has been destined by God. So when somebody dies, God came and God took them because God knew. Here it's a moist blomeki complex. 
as ek dit sien op Facebook, wil ek, Man, amal is nou sy mooiste blomiekie. It's because we don't understand God's will and God's permitted will. It's because we don't understand the basic doctrines that we have this nonsense. And then preachers preach from a pulpit and they indoctrinate people and they lie to people. Now, I'm on to this this year because I've had it with this South Africa that in the previous dispensation, people were lied to from the pulpit. They were told that it's okay, that racism is okay, that apartheid is okay. That's what they were preached. Now we are told some other hogwash. So you better know your, your basic doctrines. You better know it. As a pastor, it's my responsibility to teach this to you because the Bible says Jesus looked at the Pharisees. He said, you did not open up this knowledge to them, so therefore you will not go to heaven. You locked up the keys with the keys of the kingdom. Therefore, you yourself will not enter into the kingdom. So if I know something, I should share it so that people understand the basic doctrine so that they can walk from it. Amen? I better run. There's so much to say. It's so much truth and so much power in this. So you have the two basic doctrines. Free will is I choose what I want. And a lot with that is to do with I can change God's mind. I can pray and change God's mind. That's why I say you better know God's perfect will before you just change His mind. Because God will permit certain things. Oh, God will permit you sleeping around with that girl that you are not married to. Because God still loves you and He hopes that you will repent. That's permitted will. What is His perfect will? That you abstain. That's okay. The new world, where everything goes. More people are living together than people that are married. We take the strength of the gospel out. We make things weak. And this is not... This is not condemnation, because I'll talk to you about that now. But this is about God's perfect will. What pleases God and what pleases me? What will God allow in my life that pleases me, that doesn't please Him, but still He hopes and prays that you will make a decision to come back? And in the meantime, you're wasting your life, and sin gets a hold of you, and death enters in quicker. Because the wages of sin is death. Even though God loves you, you're still his son, you're still his daughter, but there's certain things that God cannot violate, which is his own word. Are you still with me this morning? Ek weet is warm, ek krijg warmer as jylle. Die spotlight is baie erg. So, understanding that there's these two basics, we need to know which one promotes what. So that we can walk in the freedom of Christ with which He has come to set us free. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will lead us, teach us, guide us into all truth. The Holy Spirit will, will not bring us into bondage. The Holy Spirit will not take us back under the law. But the Holy Spirit will take us into freedom. So that we can walk and run and be free and strong. Amen. It's important that I say these things because what I'm about to share will explain a lot. So let's look at what is the repentance of dead works. We think it is our good deed for the day. So we try to please God by what we do. You see a poor person, you give them money, but you don't give it to them because you really feel sorry for them. You give it because you know you should. <laughs> because the Bible expects it from you. Your mama raised you like that. If you see poor people, give to them. Give for the old days, and give for the and give for that, and give for that, and to name the church, or some other name. Gee en gee en gee. You'll get it when you get home. Because there's a law. It's not free will. And it's so funny that we as a church, we come here, we stand, and we say, bring your tithe for a blessing that God has promised. I don't look at your bank statements, but yet, when you walk around, everybody says, you're on your CRC, suck your bank starter. But the people that come collect at your home. Nothing gets ever said about that. As the older link comes up. Bruder, I've seen you have a little long glass here. You know, this is now October month. The month of the tenders. I'll knock these things. Get mad at me. I don't care. Because I've had it with religion. I've had it that this religion keeps people in bondage and it takes people to hell. I mean, since when... Are you safe for heaven because you were baptized as a baby? 
Since when? Did you give your life to Jesus or did your mama choose to baptize you while you were screaming your head off? Heilige koeie, heilige koeie, heilige koeie, heilige koeie. Don't be lied to. Don't be deceived by people. Don't be deceived by doctrine. Don't be indoctrinated. What nonsense is this that kids have to be indoctrinated and then they cannot go and seek God for themselves. Indoctrinated to, be, to pledge allegiance to the church and not to God. I'm asking these questions. Okay. Let me get off that bandwagon. So what is repentance of dead works? Dead works is to try to win God's favor by doing things or even trying to prove our goodness by not committing certain sins. I'm going to read it again. Trying to win God's favor. Trying in flesh, in your own human capacity, in your own ability to win God's favor. Or by doing things that can prove to God that you are good because ek sondag daarom nou nie soos my beerman nie, jy weet. Ek slaan daarom nie my vrou nie. Ek syp daarom nie soos hy nie. Ek gaan daarom kerk toe. Ek gelees daarom my bybel. Ek bid daarom. And these are good works. We think that we score brownie points with God because we read our Bible. The Bible is not for him. He is the Bible. The Bible is for you. Well, I read my scripture, I prayed my prayer, so I think God's okay with me now. We shall. Hey now. So how many of us do think that many times? You find yourself in sin, and what's the first thing that you do? You try to find what did I do wrong, and then you try to fix it. But in human capability, you mess it up even more. Because you can't save yourself. You can't even save the fly that is drowning in your milk. But you want to save you. This is the thing about repentance of dead works. Dead works. Works that leads to death. Okay? The definition of dead works. The good works that you think will save you. Or please God enough to bless you. Oh, how many of us do that? Lord, I have given to the poor people now. I've paid my tithes. I've given my gift. Lord, surely you're going to bless me now. I've done my part. Now you better do your part, God. Because I did my good deed for the day. I paid penance. I confessed my sin. I did my part, so God, come now. Was your deal for me bargain? And we do these things. And we do it so subconsciously that they don't even realize what we are doing. So it's things that we do to try to prove our goodness towards God. It's things that we do to try to get God's blessing. God bless me. God bless me. Think about Jacob. Jacob wrestled with God. Jacob wrestled with God. He wrestled with Him. He wrestled with Him. The whole night he wrestled, wrestled, wrestled. And then he got to a place and God looked at him and he said, Jacob, what's your name? He says, Jacob, which means supplanter, liar. So there the revelation hits him. In me, there's no good. It doesn't matter me fighting with God because I'm a liar. I'm a cheater. That's what I am. A con man. There's no good in me. God, I need you to help me now. And then God said, now that you know who you are, I will change your identity. And he put his hand on him and he said, I will give you a mark that you will remember for the rest of your life. And as long as you walk like this, you will know you've been touched by God. Now that's a whole controversial thing by itself, right? But the thing is, God touched him. And God changed his name. He says, now you will be Israel. I don't look at you like Jacob anymore. You are Israel now. If you don't have an encounter with God where God names you, where you had that amazing encounter, I had an encounter with God, because my name, Jacques, is Jacob, which means trickster. But then, what happened? I had an encounter with God. I had an encounter with God. And I will never forget that day. I had an encounter on a youth camp in Margate. 
and the Holy Spirit touched me. I was on the floor for four and a half hours, and then Jesus came himself. He sat next to me, and audibly he said, I'm changing your name. You will not walk with this name anymore. And ever since that day, he called me David, which means a man after God's heart, a man that is quick to repent. And every time that I find myself in this situation, I have to ask myself, are you now Jacques or are you David? Who are you? Are you God's grace or are you God's trickster? In the mind, you see what I'm talking about? Yeah. And what you see yourself to be is what you will be. What did you see last time you looked in the mirror? When you were disappointed. When you hated yourself. When you wanted to kill yourself. What was the last thing that you saw in the mirror? That is what you really believe about you. And you have to change that. And it only changed with an encounter with God where God tells you what He calls you, what He values you to be so that you can be built upon the cross, uh, the, the rock, Jesus Christ. Dead works are the works that we believe that we can do in order to become more righteous. It's the works that we do that we think can make us more righteous. So let's look at the definitions, the proper definitions. So, definition of works, of dead works, is the good works that you think will save you and will please God enough to bless you. Repentance means the following. It literally means to change your mind. That's repentance. Change your mind. Change your way of thinking. You literally change your mind about the works that you are busy doing right now. What I'm doing, is this going to produce righteousness or what is this going to produce? So when I do my good deed, why am I doing this deed? Am I doing it because God blessed me and I just cannot help to share? Or am I doing this because I feel obliged to do it so that God can accept my sacrifice? Are you with me? The Old Testament, it was never God's intention to get people to be under bondage. It was never God's intention to get people to try to work for righteousness. But unfortunately, people started to work for righteousness. God wanted people to understand that no matter what you do, you cannot save yourself. So just come to me by faith. Because by faith, you will receive my righteousness. Abraham obtained by faith God's righteousness. The Bible says in the book of Hebrew. Because he believed God. Each one of these men of God believed God and God touched them. Faith is the answer, not dead works. That's why if you want to excel and get out of the starting block, you will first have to repent and change your mind about these things. Otherwise, it will hold you back. Otherwise, this leg will keep you stuck there. But you have to first repent from these things, these works, these things that you think can get you to be righteous. No, your righteousness is not based upon the energy and the power that you put in here. Your righteousness is based upon that which you step on. That will propel you into the future. And once you understand and once you repent from your dead works, now you are righteous and you can step into the next level. And in that next level, guess what? Faith towards God, you can move. Boom. There you go. Dead works are the works that we believe that we can do in order to become more righteous. Jesus is our righteousness. We are complete in Him by faith. When you give your life to Jesus and you receive Jesus into your life, you are being made righteous. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians, it says, Therefore, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, and Christ has come and He has imputed His righteousness upon you. There's nothing you can do to be righteous if you are have an unrenewed mind if you are religious and you think that God is God, His ways of doing things, there's one of two things that you are. You are either unrighteous or you are self-righteous. Unrighteous, which means, well, nobody can save me. God can't love me. And you hate God for you think because He cannot help you. And you walk in unrighteousness, you live in unrighteousness as a sinner. But then you get the other side, which is called the self-righteous person. Well, I'm not that bad. I did my good deeds. I read my Bible. I go to church every week. I pray, I sing hallelujah, 
I give my tithes, so surely God must be impressed with me, you know. I did give a million rand towards that building project, you know, so maybe my million will buy my salvation. I was baptized as a baby, that means I am safe. But you live like the devil. Well, I pledged my allegiance to the church. I guess the Erkat Kasasi, and I guess I guess Angenim and Furgestel in the church. So I guess okay, shop. Here is see my brother. That stuff doesn't save you. What saves you is living by faith every day. You are born again once, but every single day you have to renew your mind. You have to repent your mind. Your mind. What am I doing now to try to get closer to God? Because what happens is, while I'm living my life, the devil brings the thought. And if I don't deal with the thought and I take hold of that thought, then it becomes a behavior in my life. Now I have to bring every thought to the obedience of Christ, casting down every imagination and breaking down every stronghold. And now I have to walk back into God's presence. But now the devil is the one saying, ah, you had that thought, you had that thought, you took hold of that thought look at you you call yourself righteous you call yourself holy but look at you you sinner you bad old filthy person look at you you should feel ashamed now you walk with shame guilt and condemnation so when you come to God you feel filthy you feel guilty you feel unrighteous you feel like there's something you need to do so now you pray your three Hail Marys and you start to give a little bit more money and you start to do this because you're trying to pay for your own salvation which Jesus has already paid with his blood That's very quick in a very short moment, everything that you go through. Because every time you want to slide back into that condemnation, guilt, condemnation, guilt. What have I done? I am not good enough. I should have done better. I should have prayed more. I should have. I should have. I should have. And you, the whole time you are limiting yourself from excelling because your foot is stuck. Not on the rock. But it's slipping next to the rock the whole time. And you keep on falling. Because you're not solid in your repentance so what are you doing to try to be good stop it because that will cause you to go bad what are you trying to prove to God stop it stop it stop it because it's not going to save you Jesus is your righteousness you are right with God because you cannot save yourself. You need Him. Jesus has forgiven you. Now forgive yourself, man. But you can't. Because you keep on beating yourself over your head with your religion. I've messed up. I've messed up. I've messed up. Look at me. You bad, bad, bad. You travel to Israel and you go through that whole thing like people do. They, 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 yeah. And then they beat themselves and they, just to prove to them that they are worthy of Jesus hanging on the cross. Jesus paid the price. Why do you want to pay it as well? Jesus says, you're not going to be saved like that. You, you need to believe in what I've done for you. It's like me giving you my car's keys and say it's yours. Now you're sitting with the keys and you're still walking. And I'm like, why aren't you driving? Well, because, you know, I didn't pay for the car. I told you it's yours. Yeah, but I did not pay for it. I have to pay for it. So I would rather walk through suffering to prove to you that I appreciate it. I'll park it in the garage and I'll wash it every week, but I'm not going to drive it because I want to prove to you that I'm a good owner. That's what we do with God. Every week try to prove to God, prove to God, prove to God, prove to God. I'm good enough, I'm good enough. Many people say, well, I can't give my life to Jesus now. I'm still a young man. I still want to enjoy my life. I still want to mess up. And I can't be like that now. I can't try to prove to God that I'm good enough. How many of us try to prove to God? What do you want to prove? <laughs> you can't prove anything. Because all you are capable of doing is sin. Without Jesus. Because the only thing you do, the Bible says it, everything you do without Christ is sin. Can I continue? Jesus saved you. Saved you. You did not save yourself. The ANC government didn't save you. Jesus did. 
the ANC used to pray to God, used to, I say, for the salvation of this nation. And this nation was saved because they prayed. Now, where's God? Nowhere to be found in the government. Nowhere. The same God that saved. So it wasn't a political party that saved you. And what's going to save this nation is not another political party. So stop putting your hope in another political party. We need to put our hope and our faith in Jesus. Because God will come in. You know, this is what I love about the whole picture of Daniel's the, the stature. It was all these government systems. From the weakest to the strongest, but it, it was all this government systems. And then the Bible says, and there came a rock that was cut out by no hand. And that rock came and it struck this government in its feet. And the whole thing was destroyed. You know, that's what I believe that Jesus will do in our nation. I don't believe that we're just going to have a party that we have to vote for. I believe that as the Christians, when we stand together, we pray together and we start to prophesy. I believe that God will send something. God will send salvation. He will send His church because the church is the rock and the church will change this nation. That's what I believe. But as long as church is just another obligation to attain God's favor, the church ain't doing nothing. Repent from that thinking. So the question is, who are we? We are righteous. We are forgiven. We are saved. We are justified. You know what I like about justified? Just as if I never sinned. Justified. I am justified. It doesn't matter what dirt you get on me. I am justified. It's not my dirt anymore. It was paid for by Jesus. But there's the other side of the coin. You don't want to continue in your dirt. Your dirt doesn't matter like pastor I preached. But you don't want to stay a pig. You want to walk in what Jesus has done for you. You want to walk and run in what Christ has done for you. Are you with me? So who are we? Romans chapter 8 verse 1. Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who do, does not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. 1 John chapter 1 9. If we confess our sins. He is faithful and he is just to forgive us from our sins. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So please. Because you see the problem of this, this, this predestination thing is. You think you know. And then because you think you know, you think you have it all. You become a Pharisee. And you become self-righteous. You see, the problem with the, with the Pharisees was, the Pharisees thought that they could keep all ten commandments. Because they found some loopholes, you know, like a lot of lawyers. They find loopholes. So they found loopholes in the law. And then they used the law to justify themselves. And they become self-righteous. And as self-righteous people, what did they do? As self-righteous people, they started walking, talking, being arrogant. And then Jesus comes in, yeah, and Jesus is just normal. And then Jesus knows more than them about the Bible, and it's already intimidating. And then Jesus comes, and He violates certain things on the Sabbath, and He, he violates certain things. And, and what Jesus does is He just proves to them that even if you think you're so great, you're not so great. Jesus asked them, He says, so who of you wants to throw the first stone with that woman? Who of you want to throw the first stone? Anyone without sin here? None. Well, okay. So why are you still here? Pick up your stone and throw it if you are sinless. Oh, but you're not. So they hated him for it. They come, they say, well, they're a rich young ruler. Jesus, I, get to, I, I fulfill all the law. I'm a rich man. I'm blessed because I am fulfilling the law. That's what he said. Not he's a rich man and therefore he's wicked. No, he, was, he thought his riches was because of his goodness. He thought his riches was because of his dead works. I have fulfilled the law. I am this. I am that. I've got this accolade. I'm this great. I'm this wonderful. And because I'm this great, Jesus, surely, what else must I do? Surely, I'm perfect. And Jesus looks at him and he says, Now sell all you have. Give it to the poor and follow me. And it was too much of an offense to him. How can you tell me to do that? Think about Naaman. Naaman had to go dip seven times in the Jordan. The Jordan was a dirty old filthy river. He's a rich man. He's not going to dip there. He's got his own bath. He's rich. 
Why can't you just tell me to wash in the bath? No, dip seven times in the Jordan, like all the commoners. I'm not going to be with the commoners. And then that little girl said to him, just do as the prophet says. And because he would humble himself, get in the river, he was healed. Jesus offended these Pharisees because they did not like his way of doing things. What did Jesus do? Jesus came to show us this. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. Just repent of your dead work. Repent of what you think you can do to be perfect. That's what you repent of. <laughs> Not sin. Sin has been dealt with. You confess your sin. Jesus, I've sinned. Because if you don't confess your sin, you're going to engage dead works to try to prove to God why you are sorry for what you've done. And all you can do is say, I've sinned. I taught my kids, if you break something, if you mess up somewhere, come to daddy and tell me. Because if they tell me, I say, okay, I can't smack you. I can't give you a hiding because I told you to come and confess. So I'm faithful and just to forgive you. Please don't do it again. But if they don't, they do like Adam and Eve. They hide behind the bush. They get some fig leaves and they do a pathetic work to try to cover up. Because that's what we do. Our good works are pathetic. They're like filthy rags. They're pathetic Pathetic works to try to prove to God we're good enough. I pray that this will bring revelation and change in this church. Because this thing that we think I have to serve to prove something. I said to these young people as well when they serve here, you're not impressing me. What we do, we do unto Jesus. If you're going to serve and try to be in excellence to, to impress me, it never going to happen. Because I am not impressed by works. I am like my father. It's dirty rags. Your, your good works does not impress me. It doesn't. It is your step of faith that draws me. Because I'm like my father. I want to be like him. So if I see you move in faith and you've got some guts to try something and step out in faith, then I am your greatest supporter. But if you keep on trying to work, 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 and do and do and do and do to prove to your pastor that you are worthy, you will never find an audience with me. Ever. Ever. Never. Ever. Ever. Because that's not what I learned from my father. He's moved by faith. And when I see people moved by faith, they get my attention. And then I come. They draw me. So please, I'm asking you, disengage from this works. Works. If it's a work, don't do it. If it's a work to be an usher, please stop it. If it's a work to be an altar worker, stop it. If it is a work to do set up in this church, stop it. If it's a work to be in media, stop it. Whatever is a work, just stop it, please. Because you will do us all a favor. But if you do it because you love Jesus, and you see the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And you see how God used you to get somebody else saved. And if you can see how God can work His anointings through you to get other people born again. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. I'm going to call halt there. Faith towards God. We will talk about next week. We have the cornerstone. Repent of all these things so that you can loose yourself from the obligation to try to be good enough. And then we're going to kick into faith next week. Faith towards God. How is faith going to help me to get into this? Because remember, this is the drive part. This is where you put in the power. This is where you break every limitation. The limitations are broken when you start to confess your dead works. And then when you step into faith and you say, I am going to attempt what I've never attempted. I'm going to believe God for what I never thought I could because I know I am righteous. I know I am justified. I know I am perfect in Christ. 
and I am healthy and well and it doesn't matter what is in my way I know the devil has no hold on me then you can kick yourself into what God has for you this year oh come on let's all stand and give Jesus praise this morning oh give him praise come on I preach better than your praise 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 him for the complete work Hallelujah. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I thank you for your word, your word that liberates us, God, that sets us free. Whom the Son set free is free indeed. The Spirit of the Lord is the Spirit of freedom. Lord, as we stand here and we repent from what we try to achieve to prove to you that we are good enough, God, we repent of it now. We change our mind, Lord. We decide we're not going to do it this way anymore. I'm going to read Bible because I love you. I'm not going to read it because I try to prove something. I'm going to pray because I love you, God. I'm not going to pray because I should. I'm going to love you, God. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to lift up my hands. I'm going to honor you and magnify you. I'm going to give my tithe because I know, Lord, your, this tithe will build your church. I'm not going to give it grudgingly. I'm going to give it freely. Come on, whatever it is that you need to repent of. Repent of it, repent of it, repent of it. Just repent of that dead work, that thing that you thought that would bring you closer to God. That thing that you have been telling yourself, that lie, to try to prove to you, God, that you are good enough, you are worth saving. You have been saved, it's done. You have to accept it by faith. You have been saved. The work on the cross is finished. You've got to believe it. It's done. It's done. Your healing is not something that you have to attain. You have been healed by His stripes. You have been healed. You have been healed. There's nothing more you can do to get healed. You have already been healed. But you've got to take it by faith. Believe God for it. No matter where you find yourself in your, any situation, in your marriage, all these fights, where everybody blames everybody for everything, but nobody wants to repent of their deeds of trying to impress their husband or impress their wife. Why does your wife have to impress you? Why does your husband have to impress you? Why do they have to be obedient? Why didn't you just love them the way that you loved them the first time you saw them with no conditions? Why is there conditions now? Why does she have to work to get your favor? Why does he have to work to get your favor? What happened? Why suddenly is there bondage in the marriage? It's supposed to be freedom. You're supposed to love one another unconditionally. Not with conditions. And if you love one another, you will give yourself to one another. You will give one another service. You will love one another. You will help one another because you love one another. Don't be selfish. But it's all about me. Lay yourself down. And renew that marriage. Whatever it is that you have to repent of. Whatever it is. Whatever, whatever it is. Say, God, help me, Lord. I can't help myself. Please, God, help me. Set me free. Heal me, Lord. Help me. Help me. You have been forgiven. You have been forgiven. You have been forgiven. You've got to receive it by faith. So while every head is bowed, every eye closed, you've come to this place today and you say to me, Pastor, my whole life, everything was based on works. How good I think I am. I'm trying to be better so that God can save me. There's nothing you can do to get yourself better. God loves you the way you are. And God is the one that will fix you up. God is the one that will heal you. God is the one that will set you free. But you need Jesus. And today you know that your life is not right with God. Your heart is not right with God. And you want to give your life to Jesus. You want to start afresh. You start new. Maybe you're standing in this place and once you did give your life to Jesus, but you kind of backslid and did your own thing. Then today, it's the day to come back to Jesus. So all over this place, if that's you, you want to give your life to Jesus, you want to come back to Jesus, then quickly, right there where you are, forget about the person next to you. This is between you and God. If that's you, you want to give your life to Jesus, you want to come back to Jesus, then quickly, right there where you are, lift up your hand and say, here I am. Please pray for me. I want to give my life to Jesus. Come on all over this place. Thank you. Thank you. Hands are going up. They're in the other locations, I know. Quickly, lift up your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? You want to give your life to Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Hands are going up all over this place. Thank you. Back there, in the middle here, in front here. 
thank you, thank you. Anybody else want to be included in that prayer? Quickly, lift up your hands. Don't fight this thing. Don't run from God. Run to God. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He wants to be the basis of your life. In Jesus' name. Once you raise your hand, you can put it down. I want everybody to look at me. If you raised your hand this morning, maybe you did not. But I would love to pray for you. So I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. In a moment, we're going to sing a song. And your love and your encouragement for your friends can help them, family. But if you raised your hand, you did not raise your hand. You know your life is not right with God. And you want to come and settle your life with God. Then I want to ask you this morning, quickly, please take your personal belongings, your Bible, so that nobody takes it afterwards. And leave your seat and come stand right here and surrender your life to Jesus. Come on right now. Come on, come on. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. So I open up my heart to you. Come on. And fully surrender. Oh, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Yes. Giving everything I am to you. I'm yours forever. So oh, come to Jesus. I open There's more of you. Up my heart just come, just come, just come, just come right now. Come, 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 come. come. Jesus said, are you weary? Are you tired? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me and I will give you a burden that is light, a yoke that is easy. This is what it is. The yoke that is easy, you just carry to Christ. You don't have to carry the weight of what you, did, what you need to try to deserve. No. There's too much pressure in this world to have to carry your sin as well. You can walk in the freedom with which Jesus has set you free. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to leave this place and you're never going to do sin again. No, you just have to repent in your mind. So when I sin and I fall and I come short of God's glory, what am I going to do to get it back? What did I do to get it in the first place? I got it by falling on the rock and praying and say, Jesus, help me. Now, I become a professional religious Christian which means I try to do things to get it back. Don't go back there. So whatever you've done, fall on the rock. Fall on the rock. Back to Jesus. As a true, repentant heart. People can judge you. Because people are mean. But you go back to Christ. You fall on the rock. Every single time, because he says, even if you do it 70 times 7, I will forgive you every single time. Because you know what it's about. It's not about you. It's about what I have done for you. Repentance of dead works. We become the super religious people where we try to fix people, sort them out. No. No. It's the grace. It's the mercy. It's the goodness of God that leads a person to repentance. And yes, I know, I also get frustrated when people does the same stupid thing over and over again. Then I want to quote that scripture in Proverbs that says, Hey, stupid, how long are you going to stay stupid? There's a scripture like that in the Bible. Because you have to renew your mind, not to be stupid. Okay, but there's a journey to walk with you to help you up every single time. Family, our follow-ups are very important. You've got to keep on going back and going back going back to that person because Jesus kept on coming back and coming back and coming back for you. Freely you have received, freely go give. Are you with me? It should not be tiring. It should be liberating. Liberating. That's what's happening here today. Liberating. Freedom. That's why we shout in CRC because we're happy. We're free. Ons kan nie stil te kerk nie. Gedienstige gedwee. Vastgevang onder jou godsdienst. Vastgedrek. 
Rimpie, sleg. Nee. We are free. And if you are free, you can't help it. To shout. Be happy, clappy. Because you're free. Amen. Let's pray. Put your hand on your heart. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you right now. And I want to thank you for paying the price for my sin. I believe that you died on that cross for my sin. I believe that you rose from the dead. You are seated in heaven. I receive your forgiveness. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, fill my heart. Lead me and guide me into all truth. You are the spirit of freedom. Thank you for setting me free. I will walk in this, the freedom with which you have freed me. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for first loving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a great privilege to be able to pray with you. We just want to take you to a special place prepared for you. We want to pray for you each individually. Give you a Bible if you don't have one. And just spend some time with you. Nothing strange. Just to help you. To encourage you to get going. And then we want to invite you back. You are born again here now. Part of the family. Come home. Keep on coming back. Let us help you to grow in Christ. In Jesus name. Please turn to your left. My right. Just follow the leaders over there. Come on. Let's give them a hand as they go. Come on family. Hallelujah. You can take your seat for a moment, please. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man sow, that also he shall reap. Be not deceived, don't deceive yourself, don't be deceived by others. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sow, that is what he shall also reap. The same measure that you use, it will be used back onto you. So when we give, we give. Not out of compulsion, not grudgingly. We give because we want to be a blessing. Amen. Family, I want to ask you to renew your pledges when it comes to the land. Okay? Because we have a target. And the target might seem impossible just like our harvest did. But God has proven to us through the harvest that nothing is impossible. And we are trusting God for 800,000 rand by the 1st of April. Okay? We are trusting God for that because we have asked for the pledges over the last year or two to, be, um, to, to, to meet our need because every month we have to pay back 30,000 rand a month to our land. Okay? So we have already, we only have 830,000 rand outstanding. Now the challenge has been that we asked for the pledges but we can see how people are not always faithful to pledges. No condemnation, I'm just saying because it's reality. If you have a pledge, and then you always meet about 80% of your pledge, because not everybody has the faith or the diligence or the whatever to reach what they have promised. Okay, so some of you have been very diligent, and I want to say thank you. Thank you to each one of you. But there are people that made pledges, and they left the church. People are gone, which means that we haven't met our target that we wanted. Okay, so the challenge is this, that every month we need to pay 30,000 rand for our land. Now, it's happened over the last few months that we didn't receive pledges of 30,000 rand, which has put a tremendous pressure on our budget, our church budget, because now our budget has to make room for that as well. And we have to pay that extra money, which has really gotten us to a very difficult place. Now, the church is not bankrupt or anything like that. Don't worry about that. All I'm asking us is to renew our pledges. If you made a commitment, just go back and honor your commitment. That's what I'm asking. Please do. Do not step back, but engage. The Bible says, if you are in the power to do so, don't withhold. Okay, so I'm asking the family to do so. And then there are many of you that have been really diligent. You have been faithful and you've done your part. I'm asking again, go speak to God and ask the Lord if he would use you again to enlarge that amount. Come on, people. This is a small amount in comparison to what we're going to need to build a church. Okay, so for the next few years, it's going to be building pledge, building pledge, building pledge. And as I said, I don't know if you have any money, I bel not know if you have any money, I don't know if you have any money, I don't know if you have any money, it's up to you. 
I'm asking you just to be diligent. That's what I'm asking you. It is your privilege, it is your honor to impartake. And then God's blessing will be upon you. Because He said so. He said so. Build my house, I will build your house. Amen? So, no works in this. No works. We do it because we love God. We do it because we love the church. We do it because we want to see the impact of this church being bigger in the future. So, let me read you the last scripture. It says, uh, the, the statement is the following. Seed stop the cycle of barrenness. Seed stops the cycle of barrenness. You can ask any person that's never had a child. Once they receive seed, they get pregnant. Now listen to this. Genesis 26 verse 12. Now Isaac sowed seed in the land. And this was in famine, double famine. And that year he reaped a hundredfold in famine. In barrenness, he reaped a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. Listen. And he became rich, richer and richer until he was exceedingly wealthy. Oh, my word. The Bible says it. He became richer and richer until he was exceedingly wealthy. Don't tell me there is no prosperity in the Bible. This is a scripture. Because he obeyed God by doing when God instructed him. So when you give... I don't ask you just to give because you want to give. I ask you, ask God to tell you what to do and where to give. Please, and be honest when you ask God, because God will tell you the amount. And then you do according to what He says, and according to your faith, He will produce back onto you. That's what will work. Not because we want your money. He owed so many flocks. Listen, He owned so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines started to envy him. He had so much that the Philistines started to envy him. It was the blessing on Isaac that got the Philistines so mad that they became enemies of Israel. Huh? Imagine that. So, today, as you give, you do not give out of compulsion. You give because you ask the Lord. What did you ask the Lord to do? And if God tells you something, obey Him. Please, I'm asking you. I pray, me, your pastor, I pray that God will make you richer and richer until you are exceedingly wealthy. That's what I pray for you. Me, your pastor, I pray that for you. I want you rich. Because if you're rich, you lack nothing. If you're rich, you can help me build. If you are rich, things will be better. If you are rich, we can make a difference out there. I pray that CRC Uppington will be the richest church in town. That's what I pray. And I pray that we are so rich that we will be envied. And I pray that you will be so rich that people will envy you. Say, Pastor, is that me vanity? Nia, it's for a purpose. It's for a purpose. It is to build God's kingdom. To get people saved. It is to build the house of God. That's the purpose. That's why I pray for it. Anything else you want to use it for, the Lord help you. Because if the Lord enriches you, then say thank you. This morning, as we watch the screens for the announcements, God bless you.